Babies may not come with instruction manuals, but there's certainly no shortage of parenting books out there. Add the sleepless nights and the endless online tips, and it can feel impossible to know what the right thing to do is. Enter Emily Oster. She is a professor of economics at Brown University who's put her expertise to use in her latest book, Crib Sheet, A Data-Driven Guide to Better, More Relaxed Parenting from Birth to Preschool. And Emily Oster joins us now. I was making a joke that I wish I met you like 10 years ago, <laughs> like two years before I had my son. Which was also two years before I had my daughter, so I wouldn't have been that useful Yeah, to you. parenting in hindsight, right? Exactly. Exactly. But it's very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so why did you decide to apply your training as an economist to parenting? So the, I got pregnant uh, <laughs> and I found that I was using a lot of the tools that I used at my job, a lot of the looking at data, trying to think through, through decisions, using costs and benefits, basically like I was doing my job mm -hmm. about my pregnancy and then later about, about my parenting. And, and um, sometimes I tell people like, I took it a little far and I like wrote these books <laughs> I wrote these books about it but I think that was that was really the genesis was my own experience and frustrations. Mm -hmm. Well when I was pregnant the first time around I was obsessed by the size of like the of the fetus, uh -huh. um, if it's like a melon oh, or the peanut. Oh, fruit, the fruit, the, the, the raisin, the, fruit, right. the nuts, yep. Yeah, yeah and I was absolutely. obsessed. But then after I had my son, I was like, I wish I had spent more time reading about what happens after the baby comes out. So when you set out to write this uh, second book, uh, what was missing in the, in the world of parenting books that you wanted to fill the gap? Yeah, so I, there were a lot of, I found there were a lot of parenting books that once I had decided what to do would help me do it. Mm -hmm. So like once I had decided that I was going to say sleep train my kid, I, there was a book that was like, there was many books that was like, here's exactly how you, how you do it. But what I, I think was missing was a book about how to make the choices about like which other book to buy almost, right? So, so this book is really about how to structure your decisions. It's a little bit less about like, this is how you, this is a step-by-step -step how, how to mm -hmm. on these things, but more about, you know, how should I decide if this choice is right, is right for me or not? So it's much more about decisions than about stepping through the, the behaviors. Well, I know there's people watching at home, uh, you know, elders in our families who are kind of like, What's the, big about, what's the big deal about parenting? We did it without the books and we were fine. What's the difference with parenting today? So in some ways, I don't think there's as many differences maybe as we as we seem. I get a lot of nice emails about uh, from older people about this that are like, "That's what I'm saying. Just like relax and enjoy it. It's gonna be fine." Yeah. Which is not exactly the message, but um, but you know, I do think that there is a lot of pressure that people are putting on themselves now about being the best kind of parent or you know. Thinking through all of the evidence, making the right the right decisions. I mean, I think that parenting has taken on a kind of I don't know anxiety that that maybe is is new or at least is feels I think feels new. Um, well, why do you think that is? I, I'm not sure. I think part of it is a demographic shift. So people are having kids when they're older. I think that that a lot of people have have achieved achieved more. Or they've done you know. So you've kind of gone through your life and you went to college and you got your job and you got your promotion and now here you are and it's like this is another thing to achieve and I think that that. Sometimes that approach can be particularly stressful because, mm -hmm. of course, achieving your parenting is not the same as achieving a job promotion. <laughs> For one thing, it's another person. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, because I think there's a, there's so much information out there that seems to contradict the information that's there. Did you find that when you were in the process yeah. of writing this? So I think one of the, the big struggles in the book and one of the big struggles in, in parenting is that you will often get two like pieces of advice that are exactly the opposite. You know, you will say, like, should I do this? And some people always say, like, if you do that, your kid will be seriously injured. Mm -hmm. And then other people will be like, if you don't do that, your kid will never love you. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh gosh, I don't want either of those things. You know? and, and it can feel like every decision is like that. So I tell a story in the book about uh, when my daughter came home from the hospital and the doctor told us to put mittens on our hands. And my mother- Because then they don't scratch Because they don't scratch her right. face. And my mother told me, if you leave the mittens on, she'll never learn to use her hands. And so what did like, you do? So I don't, I, like, I looked up, I, I like, got on the computer and I was like looking up, like, is there any research about whether <laughs> mittens prevent hand? There wasn't, you know? And so I don't know. We, I think we just left the mittens on for a little, like one, we left, I probably took them off while my mom visited and then put them back on, you know? But it feels like every decision 
is like that, like there's this, this people say this, these people say this, like how do you get to the bottom of the, of the right choice, particularly in something where you care so much about And there's about a lot it. of emotion because you could ask a simple question, I guess because uh, we rely so much on social media um, or maybe that's the way that we can, that's our village now, right? Yeah. Um, and this seems to be like, you might say something and then someone is like, oh, you're wrong and you're, and they, it goes from like step one to 10. Yeah. Why do you think um, something like parenting can draw out the worst in people? My sense is that part of it is that we all really care about doing this right. And so when there's something where you're so emotionally invested in having, in doing the right thing and thinking maybe that you've done the right thing, mm -hmm. that it's easy for advice to turn into judgment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I made this choice and I, I, when you ask me, should I make that choice? I want to say, not only should you make that choice, but that choice is so important. And the most, I know it must be right because I did it right. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the message of this book is to recognize that like the same, two different people can see the same evidence, can, can have all the same facts and could make different choices because ultimately your preferences are important for the choices that you make. And that once we recognize that, it's, it's a way to kind of dial back the judgment a little bit because then you can give someone advice and say, hey, this is what worked for me without the, the feeling like it must be what works for you too. Well, I'm glad you mentioned preferences because of all the parenting books that I read, so many, um, <laughs> I didn't really hear that parents had a preference. Like you could actually make a decision based on what's best for you because yeah. everything seems to be like the best thing the for baby. the baby. Yeah. Um, why is that important to point out in the book? So I, I think that it can feel like sometimes people are telling you any little tiny benefit for the baby would be out would outweigh even an enormously large cost for you. And I think that this book, kind of, part of what I'm trying to say is, you know, parents are also people, and having parents be happy and relaxed in their in their choices is actually maybe also good for your kid, but also it's good for you because parents are people. Parents are people. Yeah, we're <laughs> people. Like we're and, people. With, and if we're not functioning the best we can. Our families don't function. Exactly. I mean, yeah. this is something that I've learned and I'm learning. Um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, a very hard thing to learn. Yeah, and some, yeah. I want to talk to you about some of the things that can get people really riled up against each other, like friends become enemies and all that. Um, and one of the things uh, after a baby's born is breast is best. Um, when you looked at the data, what were the questions you looked at around uh, breastfeeding? So I, I really tried to, to take like a holistic view of breastfeeding. And when you, uh, when you first have a baby and people tell you here are the list of benefits, they are enormous. I mean, they include some things like better friendships. I don't know what your friends are like. My friends didn't care what I was doing. Um, so, so I tried to really dig into the data, into the, what does the best evidence say about the benefits or not of breastfeeding. And I think that the, the message that comes out there is a bit more nuanced. So on the one hand, there definitely are some proven benefits of breastfeeding. Like what? Like uh, like less diarrhea for uh, for kids, like sort of better gastrointestinal health, fewer allergies in the first year, first year or two. Um, maybe some reductions in breast cancer for mom. So that's probably the biggest long-term benefit, although it accrues to the mother, not to the not to the kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in some for some people too, it's if you don't have the money for formula, because formula is so expensive. Yeah, formula is expensive. I mean, it's th that calculation I think can be a little bit tricky mm -hmm. because actually mom's time is expensive too. And so if you're spending a lot of time at work pumping, which is not time that you are working, I think that the calculus isn't always as as clear. I've never heard that before because it's always like once you have a baby, you have to do the best thing for the baby. So if you have to pump in the closet or in the bathroom, that's what you're supposed to do. Yes. But it, But it, you're saying it has value. It has your time. your time is your time is valuable. Your time is valuable. Okay. Yes. And the uh, I guess the other side? But on the other side, you know, some of the benefits that, about long-term health and, and IQ for your kids, I think are not supported by the best data. So the claim that breastfeeding makes your kids smarter, that it's gonna make them thinner, that it's gonna reduce all kinds of, of diseases later, I don't think that those things are supported in the best data, although we see correlations there. So on average, kids who are breastfed have higher IQ than kids who are not breastfed. That is very likely differences across, driven by differences across the parents, 
not uh, by the breastfeeding itself. Something that just came into my head as we're talking, um, you know, they, there's a move for women to have mat leave and for women to be able to spend time with their families um, in the formative years, what, what is called the formative years. If you're saying that it's not that important to breastfeed, do you think that could have an, 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 an unexpected backlash in the sense that, okay, well, then you don't really need to be at home with a baby you know, if I, the data shows that it's not really beneficial so to the I child? I think that there are a lot of, we actually have a lot of benefits evidence that maternity leave, particularly a few months at the beginning, is very beneficial. And that's, a lot of that evidence comes from the US where breastfeeding rates are not very high. So there must be something else other than the breastfeeding that is, uh, that is important. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that there are benefits, they, they mostly accrue at the, at the beginning. So these things about digestion and, and so on. So I think there are good reasons to have, very, very good reasons to have maternity leave mm -hmm. uh, and paternity leave and different kinds of parental flexibility that are sort of separate from the question about breastfeeding or not. And I think also in some sense the message of the book is not that breastfeeding is like no big deal or we shouldn't do it. And in fact, I have an entire chapter about like how to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, I think just part of the, the issue is we end up putting so much pressure on women and making them feel really like shame if mm -hmm. this doesn't work or if it's not for them. And I think that's the thing we need to we need to dial back because that's not that's not healthy or helpful. Another thing that uh, parents struggle with is sleep training. Uh, should your baby yeah. sleep with you? Should they not? Um, what did you look at when it comes to sleep? So I looked at a lot of different stuff. I mean, I think for a new parent, sleep is like. It's like the main thing we're the all thinking grail. about yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, there's there's at least two big pieces to sleep. One is the question of where your kids should sleep and sort of thinking about should you have them in the bed versus in your room versus in, in another room. And there, there are some issues around sort of safety and um, where I think there are there are safer and less safe ways to to share a bed, like if you're drinking um, or smoking. Or yes. Something. Yeah. So so I think there it really it really matters. Like if you are going to share the bed with your baby, you should not drink. You should not smoke. Um, you know you should your partner should not drink and uh, and, and smoke. You shouldn't have a lot of covers and so on. I think once you once you kind of limit to, to doing this as safely as possible, there, there is some small risk to, to kids from sharing a bed, but it's really, really small. Mm -hmm. And so one of the points I make there in the book is that, that that's a place where I think family preferences end up mattering quite a lot because some people, this is really important to them. They really want to share the bed. It's a better way to sleep for them or that's, that's what works for their family. And I think that by confronting the data and saying, yes, there is a risk, but it's small. It's you know smaller than the risk I'm taking from putting my kid in the car every day. And this is something that I'm going to choose choose to do. And I think that's an important that's an important choice to give people. It's important to give them the right evidence to make that choice, but then let them make it for themselves. Um, what is cry it out? Cry it out refers to the situation, to the the practice of letting your baby uh, cry to to get themselves or leaving them. They don't have to cry, but uh, leaving them to, to go to sleep on their own, which often results in them crying and letting them cry until they fall asleep. Does it work? Yes, it does work. So, so it is, there's good evidence that if you do that for, for you know, a few nights, uh, your kid will fall asleep without crying uh, and they will sleep better and you will also sleep better. Uh, does it hurt the child? No. So this is the big, the big debate in this literature is, is this going to, like people suggesting that if you do this, your kid will, you know, not be able to form long-term attachments or have other... Uh, they'll remember it when they get older. They'll remember when they get older and they'll, they'll find you. Uh, and, and I think the evidence does not, does not support that. So, so in, actually in the short run, kids seem to be happier after this, probably because they're better rested. And in the long run, you come at sort of five or six, uh, the, there are no differences between kids, which doesn't mean you have to do. It's actually very hard. Well, that's to, what I was going yeah. to ask you because it kind of sounds like it has all these benefits, but what effect does it have on parents who are trying to do the sleep training? So I think that, that the sort of fundamental thing is in the moment, it's awful. Uh, it's awful. I mean, it is, it's awful. Uh, it's particularly bad with your first kid because mm -hmm. you don't know that it's going to work. I think most people say, well, by the time I got, they got to the second kid, they're like, well, I know this is going to work. It's going to be a terrible three days, but then we'll be, we'll be done. Um, of course, two weeks later, people are like, oh, I can't believe I waited so long. Um, the other thing that um, I think parents have a lot of guilt or, you know, um, struggle with, and I call it nanny Netflix, but uh, what did the study say about kids watching TV? <laughs> I love that, Nanny Netflix. Um, so, you know, th there isn't much evidence on screen time in general. So we have some evidence on TV. Uh, I think the best of it 
uh, comes from looking at what happened when they initially introduced TV in the 1950s. Um, so, you know, that's a long time ago. Mm. The TV was different, although people still watched a lot of it. And there, we, we don't see much evidence that some television watching is bad for kids. But what about outcomes. screen time? In Canada, the Canadian Pediatric Society recommends no screen time under the age of two. Um, what is the quality of data and around recommendations there's like that? There's no data for that. There's no good data on that question. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that recommendation. I mean, we have the same recommendation. Um, but I think it is a mistake to view it as based on evidence, or at least based on good evidence, because particularly the kinds of questions that people are interested in asking now, like, what about apps? Like, can I let my two-year-old play this app? What about watching this, you know, these, like, like the YouTube, the YouTube thing? Like, we don't, we don't know. Those are new. So if you wanted to answer a question like if I let my kid play apps, are they gonna are they gonna do badly on their fifth grade math test? Well, the kids who are in fifth grade now, they didn't have apps when they were two. And so I think there's a really like inherent limitation to that data, mm -hmm. even on top of the the limits that the kinds of people who let their kids watch a huge amount of TV are different from those who who don't. So I think this is a place where the the rhetoric around the recommendations is there's there's kind of like nothing wrong with it, mm -hmm. um, but it isn't based on good quality evidence. And then I guess also to make your own judgment. I, I think there's probably a difference between like an hour to like 10 hours. Yeah, and so I say, yeah. in the, I say in the book, like there's a sort of logic aspect of this, which is like if your kid is watching nine hours of television a day, they, they aren't awake, they're not doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And it seems also difficult to imagine that letting them watch a half an hour once a week so you can like take a shower, uh, it's difficult to imagine that that could be bad. Mm -hmm. And so then we're kind of in a, in a middle range, like what is the what is the right amount? And I think that's just hard to, that's hard to tell. In all the research that you did for this book, um, did you find anything that surprised you? There were a, f there were a few surprising things. Um, so I, I mean, in some ways the biggest surprise was how bad some of the, the evidence is. Um, and the places where I would I would get like a very specific recommendation. And then when I looked into it, it was based on nothing. So like an example of that is like food introduction. Mm -hmm. So people tell you, okay, first you give your kid rice cereal, then you give them every three days, you give them a new vegetable. At least in the US, like when you're ready to give your kid salad food, you get this like super detailed thing. And so I assume like, okay, I'm gonna go look and I'm gonna find that this is based on something. And there's, it's not based on anything. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that advice. Okay. That's a perfectly good way to introduce food, but so are a million other ways. Like, there isn't anything, there is no evidence at all behind mm -hmm. that particular Not even kind from of, doctors? Like, no, there's nothing. just not, there's just nothing. I mean, it's nothing, it's, it's perfectly fine. And I think people like to have, it's a space where people like to have advice. Mm -hmm. And so this advice is fine, but other advice, like, you know, start with finger foods or give all the vegetables at the same time. That would, that would also be fine. What about nuts, too, like with the allergies? Yeah, so then the, when we, there's this other place in food introduction, which is what, like, should you give allergens early or later? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, a, this is probably, the, in some ways, the strongest like, practical piece of evidence in the book, which is that you, you should give pe your kid peanuts and other allergens when they're little. Mm -hmm. So it was, until a few years ago, the standard advice to avoid introducing peanuts and weed and, and eggs until they're older, like a year or two. But it turns out that that actually makes them more likely to become allergic. Mm -hmm. And the effects are huge. So when they do randomized trials of peanut introduction, kids who have peanuts introduced in the, around like three or four months, mm -hmm. sort of as soon as they have solid food, they're about like 70% less likely to get to have peanut allergies. So it's like 13% versus, or 17% versus 3%. So huge, huge differences in, in risks of, of allergies. Did anything make you mad? Because I'm listening to that, and I know there's probably a lot of parents who have done that, um, only to find out that, surprise, that yeah. you can do something else. Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure that it's making me mad, but I think that, that that episode in particular, I think highlights how hard it is for people to hear about, to sort of think about data and also like understand why recommendations change over time. And my kids are eight and four. Mm -hmm. When my eight-year-old was born, they were like, don't give her any peanuts till she's two. When my four-year-old was born, they were like, spread the peanuts over him. It's like as soon bathe as you can, like bathe them in peanuts. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I, of course, I understood, I mean, I knew the literature. I understood why we had changed that recommendation. And then in fact, the evidence for changing the recommendation was really, really good. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it can feel like every day there's some different recommendation. How do I know that this is the right one versus the last one? I think that that's, that's, that's a real struggle for, for 
I don't know, policy to try to help people understand why we're coming to the recommendations we are, which is part of the work of the book, but I think should be a broader project. Um, at the end of the book, uh, you write about a conversation you had with your doctor uh, before you took your daughter to a trip to France. Uh, what happened in that conversation? So I write about this as the best parenting advice I got. So I, um, we were taking our daughter to France, and, uh, and the place we were going had a lot of bees. And so we were at the well-child visit, and I... I, was, I had this whole like scenario question. I was like, okay, so we're taking her. There's a lot of bees. It's very isolated. She's never been stung. What if she gets stung and we can't get her to the doctor? Like, here are some solutions I have. We could get an EpiPen. We could do a test. Like, what do you think? And we had this, our doctor was sort of like, yeah, I would just, I would try not to think about that. And I, and I was like, oh. Okay, and you know, it's this moment you realize like, of course, like a million things could happen. Like I've built up this crazy scenario and like, yes, that could happen, but like you, you can't worry about every tiny little thing. And mm -hmm. I think for me, that was like, that was, I think about that advice all the time in all, in many aspects of my parenting. Like, you know what, this is something, I'm just trying, gonna try not to think about this. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to obsess about this particular thing, yeah. even as someone who write, writes books, books about, about it. You know, like <laughs> all the obsessive things you could do as a parent. Yeah, <laughs> but I think you're also giving uh, parents choice, information, because I think when you don't have that, then you just kind of do something, and then yeah. 10 years later, you're like, why didn't I do something yeah, else? Or the, next, or the next day. I mean, I yeah. think part of it is if you've thought about the choice and you've made the choice that is that you think is right, then when someone comes up to you and they're like, oh, when your, your mom or your friend or some lady in the park is like, why did you do it like that? Mm -hmm. You can be like, you know what, I thought about it and it was the right thing for me. And not feel like, oh, maybe I like maybe I should have done it differently. Right. Like, maybe this lady in the park really knows a lot about my family. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, though. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> you know your child. Know. Uh, we've got about th uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, when we make a parenting decision that's informed by economic thinking, what should we consider? I think that first you should look at the evidence and think about what the data really says. And then you should combine that with your preferences and think about the costs and benefits and how you weigh those things. I think the most important thing is to to be to try to be a little bit objective about the decision, but recognize that that you you can that even if something is not perfectly safe, or even if it isn't, it's there's some reason that you as a parent would benefit, and maybe it's not the best thing. Maybe it could be a little costly for your kid. That still could be an okay choice mm -hmm. for your family. Emily, thank you so much for being here. Fantastic book. Thank you. Book. Thank you for having uh, me. That was Emily Oster, the uh, author of Crib Sheet. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.